Hi, I'm Jeff Raines, the pastor of First Baptist Church Shreveport. I'm so glad you're listening today to the First Baptist Podcast. We worship every Sunday at 1030 a.m. at 543 Ockley Drive in Shreveport. There is always a place for you. Thank you so much, Renee and choir and musicians for leading us. Uh, you do such a, a great job every, every week in helping to lead us in worship. Uh, we're going to look today at a really important topic, and it's a challenging one, um, because Jesus gives really a blanket condemnation of something that uh, to some degree seems necessary, and to some degree it comes very, very natural to us, and, and that's judging other people. So our action step for discipleship this week, we'll just uh, lay it out here at the beginning, is be very careful when you judge and start with yourself. Uh, how do you like being judged? Uh, in high school, I was in the band for a couple of years and played the French horn. Um, and you don't want to enlist me for the orchestra, Luke, because I was not a great French horn player. I worked hard at it, uh, but I could just never get a, a good tone, and then, you know, that time of the year would roll around when uh, we would have to do our individual playing before a judge, and they give you a ranking on your, your playing, and I worked so hard on that piece, but I just knew because I didn't, just couldn't get the tone down, I knew no matter how hard I worked that the uh, judgment was not going to be great there. Now, other times, Maybe in school I felt really confident in, in seminary going into an oral exam on the book of Romans. I could just you know, regurgitate a lot of information. And so I had the whole outline of Romans down and felt totally confident and no problem. Now one really unusual setting of judgment is preaching class. Because what you do in preaching class, you learn about preaching but then you have to write a sermon and stand up in front of your peers and your professors and everybody and give a sermon. My preaching professor was Russell Dilday, who was a, a legend uh, in Baptist life, so that was intimidating. But, but you would get up to prepare this sermon and, and you say something and you would see every head in the room go down and write something. And so you don't know if that's good, is that bad, what I do, what I say. They could comment on everything from hand gestures to uh, annoying mannerisms to your content to all of it. So that was kind of an intimidating setting of judgment. And I guess in, in preaching, often you're judged. I, I have a good friend who's a pastor, and he got a note from a, a TV viewer. It wasn't, even, wasn't someone in the room, but their note, he opened it up, and it just said, could you please stop flapping your arms like a bird because it's very distracting. So... If you ever notice me doing that, you can tell me to stop, I guess. Um, but a, a lot of activities that, that we do through life require judgment. If you've done dance or gymnastics, that's just part of it, uh, that you are judged for it. As adults, we, we get judged. One of our staff, who was, will remain unnamed, was pulled over right in front of the church this week and given a ticket. So he's planning his appeal before the judge already. Um, uh, or, or maybe you have a, a neighbor who has commented on your lack of lawn care. We can feel judged. Or it's social media. We've, when we post a picture, um, we can feel judged by, do people react to it? You know, we can feel judged by that. And, and when do we tend to judge others? Some people have a really finely attuned ability to critique other people. They can sit in a restaurant and find flaws with everyone around them. Can you believe she went out in public wearing that? Or I can't believe they let their children do this. Or did you see the tattoos on that way? You know, on and on it can go throughout the whole meal. And I, I know I struggle with judgment. For me, a lot of times it's driving. It's like, why are they going too slow? Why are they sitting there looking at their phone when the light's green? Um, I maybe need to work on patience, do you think? Uh, but a, a lot of times we judge without thinking. It, it's kind of automatic. It just flows out of us. Uh, uh, sometimes information is presented to us really designed to elicit a rush to judgment. You know, how often do, do we do that when we see something? Or, or when we're talking with someone, one of the most fun things to talk to someone about is somebody else. 
You know, you can bond by uh, judging someone else. That's easy and great fun. And, and judging can make us feel better about ourselves. Hey, and we can knock other people down a, a notch or two. And maybe we can look down on them in self-righteousness. Well, well, today we're going to look at two passages. Um, the one that we read earlier in Matthew 7 and then also 1 Corinthians 5 that, that talk about when we can judge, who we can judge, what's the proper context for judgment. So let, let's start back at Matthew 7 again. Matthew 7, verse 1, Do not judge or you will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Um, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say, let me take the speck out of your own eye when there's a plank in your eye? You hypocrite. Take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Uh, so here's an important issue here. Who gets to judge? Who is qualified to judge? Through the years, our boys have had a lot of dreams about what they wanted to do when they grow up. And, and so there were a lot of the typical ones, you know, firemen or policemen, you know, noble, noble paths for sure. At, at one point, one of our boys wanted to be a cowboy paleontologist with a monster truck. I mean, that's just cool. Who wouldn't want to do that? Um, but then at one point, one of our boys really latched onto the idea of being a judge. And it was, you know, seeing the, the, the judge in their robe kind of up, sitting up high. And then when the judge comes in, everybody stands up. And that sounded great. To them. But becoming a judge is not a simple thing, and it shouldn't be. We depend on judges to be impartial and fair and wise, and, and judges can be a last resort for people who have been abused or, or vulnerable. They serve this essential function in our culture. And something Jesus does when he tells this, this story is he, he limits, defines carefully who is qualified to judge other people. So in this passage, this is one of the passages that, that makes me think that Jesus was really funny. You, you know, it's such a funny picture. It's like a cartoon that he describes uh, here of this person who is eagle-eyed with flaws and other people. They can pick out the finest thing even from a distance. And then when they go to help them, they've got this plank sticking out of their own eye and they're batting them on the head with it. And Jesus doesn't say that old plank eye doesn't get to, to judge anyone or critique anyone, but he says that he should go through a process first of plank removal. It's self-examination. It's prayerful searching of our own hearts. That's an essential process. Now, some people are self-critical to a fault or even to a debilitating degree, I recently read a book, John Green's um, The Anthropocene Reviewed, and he talks freely in this book about his struggles with OCD and anxiety, and he has this great description of what happens when he would lay his head on the pillow at night to go to bed. He, he said his mind would say to him, okay, do you want to review your blooper reel? And, and he says to his mind, no, I'm here to go to sleep. And then his mind says, okay, let's start when you were six years old, and, and goes through all the things that he had done uh, that had caused him to be ashamed all through life. And that's not what Jesus was talking about, of a, a maybe morbid self-examination, but I, I think plank eye in this, this cartoon picture that Jesus sketches is that kind of person who just completely thinks that they are in the right all the time, that they are righteous, that they are just, that God is very impressed with them. And in fact, God has given them the job of pointing out flaws in other people so they can raise their game to, to be like them. The, the self-righteous person is a dangerous judge, dangerous to other people and dangerous to themselves. And this is one of those passages where Jesus connects how we treat other people and, and how we will be treated by God. Um, for in the same way that you judge others you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. So Jesus connects these two things. Uh, so how does that work? Is this just kind of a natural process in the world, or is this the divine process of God's judgment of us? I, I think it can be both. 
I, I wasn't aware of this play before. I read Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, uh, which is a play drawn from this passage, uh, and it's the, the story of the Duke of Austria, and he leaves, and a fill-in uh, is ruling, and, and he is a very upright and, and righteous. He's just got this sterling reputation, and he immediately starts enforcing the laws with a severity never seen before, and condemns uh, this man for um, adultery um, and condemns him to death. And this man's sister goes before this fill-in governor and pleads for mercy and pleads for mercy. And he ends up falling in love with her and demanding that she sleep with him in order to release her brother. It's obvious hypocrisy. And, and like so many of Shakespeare's plays, there's layer after layer after layer uh, of offenses uh, and the need to forgive, and, and then it comes around at the end, and mercy is bestowed all around, though it's painful for some of the people. Um, but that idea of measure for measure, you are measured uh, with the standard that you measure others. I, th I think there is a natural rebounding of a spirit of judgment when we are biting and critical and harsh of people around us, that pollutes the waters around us. Maybe you've experienced this in a work environment where the culture of the place is just toxic and the water cooler break room conversation is vicious and biting at anyone who happens not to be present. And it's no surprise in a culture like that, that as you dish out judgment, that you receive judgment. Judgmental spirits are contagious. So if you are leading anything, whether it's a family or an organization or a bridge club or tennis group, um, your attitude helps to either clear the air or pollute the air. And if you're contributing to a spirit of judgment and tearing down, don't be surprised when that rebounds on you. <clears throat> There's a, a case a few years ago in Cleveland of a landlord named Nicholas who um, was brought before the judge because he had these repeated violations of property standards and, you know, just terrible conditions for his tenants. The places were falling apart and there were rats and, and it was just nasty. And so he, he was brought before the court and, and the court ruled against him and, and said that um, he could not buy any other properties until he had cleaned up the ones that he owned. Well, he totally ignored that ruling and just kept violation after violation. And, by, and so he was brought before the judge again, and he was fined $100,000 this time, and he was sentenced to house arrest in one of his own properties for six months, and he could only leave to go work on his other properties or go to church. Uh, so there it can be a natural process at work here um, of, with judgmentalism and critical. But the really sobering thing about this is the idea that there is a divine process at work. What about our own judgment before God? This is actually the third time in the Sermon on the Mount, um, in chapter 6 of Matthew and here in chapter 7, where Jesus connects how we treat other people and how God is going to treat us. And so in the, in the, uh, so in the Lord's Prayer, he taught us to pray, very famous line, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He connects those two things, and, and lest we miss the point, he immediately after the prayer says, for if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive you your sins. So if we combine these two statements and the one about judgment, we have this correlation between mercy and judgment here. And we can picture it like a door. It's either open to grace or closed to grace. And so if it's open, if we are full of grace and mercy toward other people, God's grace and mercy flows to us as well. But if it's closed and we are critical and judgmental, then we can't receive God's grace or mercy either. Uh, the person who is saved by faith through grace, that's what the New Testament teaches, that we are saved by faith through grace, believing in Jesus Christ. That, that is being aware of the awesome mercy of God, God's great forgiveness toward us, and, and so we reflect that towards others. But if we are filled to the brim with judgment 
and criticism and resentment, that's a sign that we really haven't recognized the depth of our forgiveness or the grace that God has shown toward us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, judgment is necessary from time to time. Jesus recognizes this. Later in Matthew, he tells us that if someone is in sin, you should definitely go and gossip about them. No, that's not what he says. If someone is in sin, he says, go privately and talk to them about this. And if they don't accept that, take a couple of others with you. So there's, there's witnesses to this. And if they still won't listen, then you're to treat them as outsiders, like the pagan or the tax collector is how Jesus puts it. So sin matters. Uh, recently, we looked at the story of the woman caught in, adul in adultery, and they're ready to stone her. And Jesus says, he who is without sin should cast the first stone. Much like this judgment passage, he limits who can participate. But then he says to the woman, go and sin no more. So we need to make sure that sin is not running amok. It, it hurts our witness. It hurts the church. It hurts the sinner. Um, so it, that's, that's an important role. But he's really limited who can participate in judgment. And then another issue is where is the focus of our judgment? And so that takes us over to 1 Corinthians 5 where there's a scandal that, that is just tearing apart this church um, about a relationship between a man and his stepmother. And we, we know in the Roman world, all kinds of immorality and relationships were accepted. Um, but, you know, just that, that was all out in the culture. But Paul says this scandal in the church is worse than what the pagans were doing. So why in the world have they tolerated this? Some have speculated that Maybe his house was the house where the house church met and was influential uh, in that way. But for whatever reason, they've overlooked this sin. And so Paul clears up a misconception in 1 Corinthians 5, 9. He says, I, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning people of the world who are immoral, or the greedy, or the swindlers, or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is immoral or greedy or, or an idolater or slanderer or drunkard or swindler. So what he's saying is we should not be surprised when the world is acting sinful. That's what the world is going to do. That people around us will do outrageous things. That's no surprise. But Paul's saying, I, I was telling you not to put up with that in the church. In, in verse 12, he says, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will ju judge those outside, but expel the wicked person from among you. So who do we judge according to this passage? Um, it, it's, much, it's much like old Plank Eye with the same message that we need to look within ourselves First, work on removing that plank. And that can be a long and arduous process for us. And, and it can be a great struggle and we can experience a lot of brokenness in wrestling with, with our own sin. We have a lot of stuff to work on. And when we've gone through that process truly, that helps us to be able to help other people to go through a similar process. And what he says is for the church, our job is, is not to judge outsiders and throw stones and point out sin. Now, when someone within the church body is in egregious sin, we need to deal with it, like Jesus described. That's where our focus should be. But Paul is so clear with this when he says, what have I to do with judging outsiders? That's God's job. And, and I think sometimes we get this exactly backwards, that, that we overlook our own flaws, but we are very judgmental toward those who are outside. And, and some preachers and churches specialize in just railing against the sins of the world week after week. Do you know what appalling thing this appalling group is doing out there? And, and sometimes they're described as brave or prophetic. They're really angry about sin out there. But is it really brave to call out the sins of people who are not in the room or, or people you don't have any kind of relationship with? It's just building up a sense of self-righteousness within the church. And I've never felt called to that kind of ministry because of what Paul says right here. That, that uh, what we're called to do, and really the bravery is found in looking at our own sins 
and our own temptations and our own struggles. Paul and Jesus agree that we need to be focused on our discipleship. That's the process we've been talking about all year. Um, how can we be better as followers of Jesus, more faithful? Uh, what do we need to set aside, uh, leave behind? What do we need to start doing? What do we need to do more? And one of the biggest dangers of, of plank eye, uh, of pointing out everybody else's sins out there in the world loudly and often, it is a problem that goes to the very core of what we are called to do as followers of Jesus and as His church. Uh, why are we here? What is our job? Hey, it's the Great Commission. We are to be making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Hey, he doesn't give us the job of, commend, of condemning the world. Uh, he gives us the job of reaching them for Christ. And so we can either spread judgment on the world or we can spread the truth of the gospel to the world, but we can't do both. That's not compatible. If our attitude is angry and judgmental and pushing other people away, sinners from us, how can we tell them about the grace of Jesus Christ? So our discipleship step this week is a difficult one, and this is challenging, but be careful when we judge and start with ourselves. And I think when we look within, we'll find there's a lot of work for us to do and it develops a lot of humility in us and grace that helps us to fulfill our mission of proclaiming Christ to all nations. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this is a hard word and is a challenge for us. And, and so I pray that you would give us a, a really overwhelming spirit of your grace, of what you have done for us, of how you have forgiven us, and that we would be people who show that grace to others. And I pray that you would, would heal us of our critical spirits um, and our desire to build ourselves up by tearing others down. But um, Lord, I pray that you would, would heal us with your love and grace and help us to show your love and grace to this world. So give us discernment in this area. Give us wisdom. Um, give us bravery and, and courage as we seek to follow what you've taught us in this passage. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for listening today to the First Baptist Shreveport podcast. You can learn more about our church and watch the services at firstbaptistshreveport.org.